I and all sentient beings, until we achieve enlightenment, go for refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. By the virtues I receive, by giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Now, as far as we're concerned, that's Buddhist, that is. How we treat living beings is uh, very important. And as we undertake a practice to realize that we are not sinful by nature, but what makes us feel condemned and causes us to condemn others is our own confusion about, about everything, you know, I mean, just totally confused about the nature of reality. That's what makes us condemn ourselves. And condemn others. So when you take refuge in the triple gem, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, we become responsible to ourselves uh, as a follower of the Dharma. In this way, we're isolating ourselves in a certain way from everything out here. We're isolating ourselves from others. We're isolating ourselves from the rest of the world in the sense that we no longer regard anything out there as a source of our salvation. In other words, we have no scapegoat. And so this um, has to be done on the everyday level of our existence. You know, it's extremely, extremely personal, even though we talk about uh, things not being personal and we talk about non-person. But on one hand, understanding it in a certain way, it first is a very uh, personal. So it's difficult and we're initially afraid to look at ourselves. We're afraid to think too deeply. We are um, a wounded uh, because of our confusion around life and, uh, and just trying to understand and unpack the uh, vicissitudes of life. We used to sing the downside of everything because we've depended on people, places, and things to make us happy. And when they disappoint, which they always will at some point, there is this dissatisfaction, and there is this unhappiness, there is fear, and there is confusion. And so we have to work with a, a kind of a sense of a, of a of a sacredness, and maybe a, a better word would be a, a preciousness, or maybe even a, just a richness that can unfurl the most magical aspects of our experiences. And this is a path that shows us that way. So I thought I'd talk to you today on what it means to go for refuge to the Buddha, to the Dharma, and to the Sangha. We have not had a refuge, well, I think we had one refuge ceremony since we've been here, and that's almost two years. And so it's probably time that we offer another. But when we do, we like to build up to it so a person knows exactly what they're signing up for, what they're making a commitment to. I mean, when we make a commitment, you know, uh, it appears that we're making a commitment to someone else or to others, but actually whenever we make a commitment, we're making that commitment to ourselves. Whether we do or don't do, keep or don't keep our commitment, you know, we are the owners of our own actions. So any commitment we make to others, we are in fact, we are actually making uh, to ourselves. And everything in this bizarro world seems to be like that. And it's not that the world is bizarro, but that our understanding of things is turned inside out, upside down. And it is said that this is a Dharma that turns that which is upside down, right side up. And so we're always thinking about things that bring us pleasure, things that make us happy. And the Buddha says, look at it closely. If you look at it closely, if you look at it deeply, if you take it all the way to its conclusion, you'll see the inherent suffering in the very things that we call the things that bring us the most happiness. And so as we, uh, uh, before we are really able to fully investigate this, um, you know, all of the objections come up about that. Well, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with having a partner? What's wrong with buying a new car? What's wrong with getting a good job? What's wrong? And there's nothing wrong with any of these things. The, the point is that 
these things will not bring you lasting happiness. And when that time comes, we find an inability to cope with what was inherently embedded in the very things that we sought for our, for our happiness. Now, this is a very superficial uh, understanding, but most of us don't grasp that. That's why we have in the West this materialistic kind of, of practice, this, you know, we, we're really learning how to be happy with our things. It's almost like a I'm okay, you're okay doctrine, but it's not a I'm okay, you're okay until we really recognize that we are okay. Before that, it's, it's a false kind of thing. It's an, uh, an, uh, it's, it's an illusion that allows us to stay in our delusion because we just don't have the heart. The, uh, we can't, uh, as I saw this movie one time, long time ago, Bonte. I saw this movie one time. I'll tell you about the one I saw last night or later. <laughs> And uh, and this guy was saying, you know, like, we just want the truth. And finally, the man turned to him and said, you can't handle the truth. Yeah. And so it's like that for us. Like, we want the truth. But most of us in our current state, we can't handle the truth. And so the Buddha said he had a gradual way of instructing. He had a gradual way of correcting. He had a gradual way of encouraging that would help us bit by bit to dispel our delusion and our illusions and our fears so that we could uh, gradually see. My brother, when um, laser surgery first came out, you know, he was one of the first ones to get it. And he, uh, and he was like just bragging on this laser surgery and how he had 20-20 vision now. But the downside of it, I'm, I think it's improved now, but the downside of it then was when he stepped from outside to inside, everything went black. You know, so he fell when he would go into, a, 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 go from outside into a building. When he stepped from inside of a building to outside, it was so super bright that he fell. Uh, and, and that part had to be, had to be, uh, uh, corrected. And it's like that when we're learning something, that when we step into, uh, these brighter places, we fall, we stumble and fall as often as we do as when we step into our, our dark, our dark spaces. And so he says, I use a gradual approach. First, I, I, you know, talk to them about this. I encourage them about that. I admonish them about the other. And when I see that they have understood that and they can use that and put that to some good use, then I go on and I instruct about this. And so it's that way. Now, some people talk about sudden enlightenment. And I mean, when it happens, it, it, it is sudden, but it's been gradually approaching to, to that to that sudden awakening. And so that's the way I just dispelled the total argument between the two schools about sudden, sudden enlightenment and gradual enlightenment. You know, um, uh, there's a, uh, a way that we can deal with people that's not always dealing with the question that they pose or, or the circumstance that they present. But in everything through wisdom and compassion, we can find a way a way of of escape and uh, uh, developing our skillfulness uh, allows that allows that to happen. So the Buddha found the awakened state of mind by relating to the situations that existed around him in his life, and you know the everyday confusion, the chaos, you could call it the insanity of those times, just like the insanity of this time. And he was able to look at those situations very clearly and precisely. And he disciplined himself by working on his own mind. Now, there's two things that we don't like. One is discipline. The other is working on our own mind. You know, so he just starts right there, like, where we don't want it, you know, but he said, look here, because this is the source of all the chaos and confusion that you see everywhere. And instead of becoming an anarchist, you know, and, and blaming society, he worked on himself and he attained what is known as, as Bodhi or, you know, awakening or enlightenment. And, 
and when that final and ultimate uh, breakthrough occurred for him, he was able to to teach and to fully work with sentient beings without any inhibition. Uh, so, of course, we work with whatever we have, whatever capacity we have, and some, he said, is better than none. So taking refuge in the Buddha is considering him as an example um, that we can emulate. Okay, it, it, uh, It's an example of an ordinary human being who saw through the deceptions of life, yet um, when we're able to walk in an ordinary fashion, we can find that way leading upward that helps to build us on spiritual levels. And so it doesn't mean that there are no Davids. It doesn't mean they are not different classifications of beings. It doesn't mean they are not Brahmas. And, and however you want to define those mind states, it just means that we don't have to uh, rely on them as the source of our salvation. Now, sometimes we have good friends and we have not so good friends, but they're still our friend. You know, there's uh, some people, I know I am a good friend to them, uh, but they are not a good friend to me. But that's okay. I choose to be a good friend to them. And so we have good friends and not so good friends. And good friends support us in certain ways. So you could say that if we've made friends with beings on who are, are, are really flowing from a certain state of, of mind, that they could be, their energy around us, their presence with us could be supportive to us in a certain way. But that's entirely different than relying upon them for your salvation. So do you understand the difference? Many times we talk about uh, um, Buddhism or being a non-theistic, but he did not say there weren't these different classifications of beings. He just said that they didn't need our worship, number one, and number two, that we would not be able to uh, ultimately rely on them for our freedom. We have to um, um, we have to unpack it and realize it for ourselves. No sacrificial lamb. Something, something like that. So living in a theistic society, whether we accept it or whether we re reject it, we are influenced by, uh, by such notions. And so we have to really come to a, a clarity about that or we can only go so far. You know, when... Uh, when there's a, a, a baby can recognize uh, his, his or her mother or father. And as they get a little bit on, older, they think that there's only one mother and father, and that's mine. And then a little bit later, you know, when they're like elementary school level, they recognize their other mothers and fathers, but... Mine is the best mother and father. Even if they're terrible parents, the child thinks mine is the best mother and father. And then, you know, as they grow older, they uh, cut their reliance on mother and father. They make a lot of mistakes as adolescents, making that transition into adulthood, finding out what's in their own mind, charting their own course in life, trying to remember wise instruction, and sometimes deciding that what was supposedly wise is uh, uh, definitely detrimental and having to abandon something that they were indoctrinated into, perhaps. Uh, or finding, just finding out who they are on a fundamental, on an on a, uh, ordinary level, who they are as human beings. And so it's like this also in, in spiritual matters. And so as we are growing and developing, we may have some thoughts or ideas about what things are or, or where our helps come from. But as we continue, you know, to uh, examine our life as it is, we may come to different conclusions. And sometimes it's difficult. We find ourselves in more of a tizzy because we're cleaving to the old, trying to take hold to the new, and we get totally turned around. And so there takes a, a what I suggest, and you know, people call us all the time asking us questions, you know, about things like that. 
Uh, what should we do with Jesus? What should we do with God? Or what, you know, and just this confusion. So I said, well, do you know? He said, yes. I said, well, then, then you know, you, there's nothing you need to do with him. He's, he's all right all by himself. You don't have to defend him. He doesn't need any defense. He doesn't need, you know, and if you have that relationship and you know it to be so for your fact, then you go, you go by what, by what you know. So if someone else has him, say, well, I don't believe that. I mean, well, what does that matter to you? You know, uh, so you can hold what you have directly experienced, you know, regardless of whether you're surrounded by by naysayers. We uh, in our Dharma Charya class last week, uh, we did the uh, pri last month we did the Prison of Life by um, uh, Buddha Dasa, and who I love so much. And then he went on and he started talking about religion. Uh, being superstition. And so I, in um, doing a commentary on his commentary of some suttas, I left out the one section about that. And I asked the, uh, the students why they thought I left it out. You know, and they said, well, well, they didn't know, but they were curious as to why I left it out. So he was very definitive and very clear that all religion is superstition. That might be his definition of religion, but I'm talking about when you have a certain uh, uh, direct experience, I don't care what other people call it, they can name it something or, you know, or they can um, try to explain it away in any way that they have not experienced it. So uh, what is there to get into, a, a, you know, um, an argument with them? about that, about just let them, let them be. One time I was talking to uh, uh, Stephen Batchelor and, and, you know, and, and it was both sides of this argument because he's a great proponent of, of secular, secular Buddhism and, um, and he was telling me about something and I was telling him about something and, uh, and he said, uh, and he was trying to tell me and convince me why he was right. And I said, but you know, Stephen, here's the thing. The only thing you're telling me about is what you don't know about, what you haven't experienced. So how can we even be having this conversation? You know, and so at that point, we just both laughed and we both dropped it. And we both walked away, you know, having heard each other. And I think we walked away both um, holding. It doesn't have to be tightly. You can just hold it. You don't have to hold it tightly, but you can hold your own experience. You know, the Buddha said um, we should, we, we can say this is true. He said, but never say, and this only is true. So even when you're staking a claim for your direct experience or something that you know directly, he said, leave some room there. Not necessarily to wiggle out of or deny what you know, but to enlarge what you know by coming to know something you didn't know. And so this is how we should hold everything in life. You know, our, our, the greatest part of our aggravation in life is our cleaving to our views of what we already know or how we already see something or how we do something or how we understand something. And that's what causes so much consternation with us. He says, you can, you can uh, say you know that or you understand it that way or this is, is beneficial. He said, but don't cleave to that as the only way to do so. If you do, you just bring a lot of, of suffering uh, onto yourself and, and also onto others. So if we have to work this with a sense of a sacredness or preciousness or, or a richness that can uh, reveal to us the, the uh, magical aspects of, of the experiences in our life. And this is a path that shows us this way. Now, because um, I've been trained in both schools and, and they approach things from two very uh, different perspectives, they're often seen as contrary or adversarial to each other. That's like within the Theravada school and the Mahayana and Vajrayana schools. But once you really understand it, it all folds together and you recognize that there's two uh, ways of looking at something that uh, end up uh, folding in to one central view.
someone asked me, how do you, uh, yesterday, on a conference call, how do you deal with unconscious people, Panyawadi? Um, and I told her, you know, uh, or she asked how she should deal with unconscious people. I told her she should just leave them alone <laughs> and don't let them destroy her happiness and make her act like them. And, you know, the thing is, like, if you have to ask, you know, if you have to ask, you're not ready to deal with them. You understand? And so uh, sometimes we just have to look at where we are and what it is that we can accommodate where where we are. So sometimes it means that doing whatever we have to do to keep our own minds peaceful and 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 at ease. And and the self examination that it takes to deepen that uh, capacity or or capability and how we get it is through our first our study and then our embodiment of the dharma so we take refuge in the in our dharma of self realization as a sure path to discovering and completely uncovering an innate wisdom and com and compassion instead of being like a spiritual shopper hoping and uh and looking and searching and hopping from you know every newfangled and sometimes old-fangled idea out here looking for something to make us better or whole or spiritual and then we drag others off you know uh, instead of respecting why they came here and the discipline and the commitment they've made for their uh, internal uh, search and investigation. So I say, if you come, come to see what's offered, but don't come to drag people off to go out there reaching and searching for something. If they go, fine, but let them go by themselves. Don't you be the one that drag, drags them off when they've come and made a commitment to seek out something uh, for themselves internally. So better yet to come taking our time together to investigate and strengthen what we are learning and what we're studying and what we're trying to put into practice and what we are realizing. So look at our, at our conversations when we get together and have chit-chats. What are we chit-chatting about? The Buddha talked about animal talk like moo, <laughs> woof, woof. And he called all of this talk about um, uh, persons, places, and things, he all of this outer worldly stuff, he called that animal talk. So he said that even when he came and he uh, saw people, he'd spend a few moments greeting them, asking how, how are they doing, how's their welfare, how's their family, and then he'd get on to uh, the purpose for him being there, that he might uplift them in a certain way. So I'm not saying we never have any conversations about that, but that should not be our total conversation every time we get together. It's about that kind of conversation. But we should use this precious time that we come together to encourage and, and, uh, and lift one another, encourage them in uh, right view and right understanding and right action. And so... That starts with a personal commitment to contemplate the things that appear in our individual lives, uh, allowing reflection to deactivate, to disempower, to break down, to disassemble the reliance that we have on outside influences to dictate our responses to cause and condition. And, and it culminates in, a, in the freedom of self-reliance of one who truly knows and truly sees existence as it is. And then one can face the eight worldly winds, praise and blame, loss and gain, pleasure and pain, fame and shame, these eight worldly winds without either pride and arrogance or without regret. Mm -hmm. And nobody can do this for us. We have to do it ourselves. So this is a, a kind of gradual uh, unfolding, a gradual revelation, like bit by bit, everything becomes more precise, everything becomes clearer through reflection and through redirecting the mind's attention in reliance in the beginning upon teachings and then through exercising complementary actions uh, again and again until we know definitely for ourselves, this leads to my suffering or this leads to the suffering of others or this leads to both of our suffering. 
And he says, and when we know that for ourselves, then the transition becomes complete. No, usually there's a, a basic thread that kind of runs through our experience. And I like the way that uh, Trump or Rinpoche uh, expressed it, and so I'd like to quote him here. He says, usually the basic thread that runs through our experience is our desire to have a purely goal-oriented process. Everything we feel, uh, Everything we feel should be done in relation to our ambition, our competitiveness, our one-upmanship. And this is what usually drives us to become greater professors, greater mechanics, greater carpenters, greater poets. You know, but the Dharma, passionlessness, cuts through this small goal-oriented vision so that everything becomes purely a learning process. And this permits us to relate to our lives fully and properly. So taking refuge in the Dharma as path, we develop the sense that it is worthwhile to walk on this earth. And nothing is regarded as just a waste of time. Nothing is seen as a punishment. And nothing is seen as a cause of resentment and complaint. So that lets us know where we start. Uh, the easiest places to start with our complaints because we have many of them throughout the day. Uh, I uh, the other day we uh, uh, the appraiser is coming and we've had nothing but rain and so when we have a window where there's not rain and where it's not overcast to dry out everything because wood you know our wood is old on our decks and so forth and it soaks in so it, it takes more than a few hours of sunshine to, to really dry out our wood. And so we have to catch windows to, to do things. And so we had to paint uh, the decks. And so I um, unlocked the basement door and I said, today we're going to paint the decks. So that means when you come into the uh, resident kitchen, you have to come into the basement and come up the stairs. And right away there was grumbling, you know, like, oh, it would have been more convenient if we did it in the afternoon. But we couldn't rely on being able to do it in the afternoon. And we had to schedule several things. So it was, you could either walk up the steps and walk in the kitchen or walk in the basement and walk up the steps and be in the kitchen. Just one flight of steps either way. But it became a source of irritation. I got irritated because they were irritated about the in, about the inconvenience, you know. And so when I went outside, it, was, it took me about five minutes to realize that I was irritated by their reaction, and they were irritated by what you know uh, how we how we had to do it. I'm like, what? Well, what is the difference? You know, there's really no difference. There is irritation there, you know, and just seeing that completely erased, you know, because sometimes you, every time you walk back, then you see the person and you're still irritated. You're irritated over what happened yesterday, what happened last week, what happened last month. It is so ridiculous. And so in that moment, and I'm saying this as an example, because this is how, you know, we, we learn how to drop these things, these habitual tendencies, these ways of looking and the ways of doing that keep us just running around in, in a, a devolved, devolved state. And so I said, now, there's no difference in me being irritated over their irritation than them being irritated over having, you know, uh, to do it at that time in that way. Irritation is just irritation. And so I, I, I dropped it, but it's, it's being honest with yourself in that way. You know, it's going back and uh, reflecting any time there's a disruption within oneself. You know, it's, it's a, if it's a disruption in you, that's in you. I don't have to take that on, but if I take that on and now I'm experiencing the suffering, then I need to look at that. You know, and the more I, I get better at having the right response, uh, staying cool, staying passionless, then the easier it becomes and the more compassionate I become when someone else is disturbed or perturbed. You know, so that's how we, we can hear it till the cows come home, but it's in the reflection. It is in the firm agreement that this inures to suffering and this doesn't, 
you know. It's going back and trying it again and again and again until we get it right. And they're just lessons, not anything to be accusatory by. Then um, when we get it this way, then life takes on a different quality. Learning takes on a different quality. You know, I was with my um, uh, Buddha master a couple of weeks ago, and he like he just he read me up one side and down the other, and I was like, "You don't even know me like that." And but but I knew he did. You see, I knew from his development he did know me. He knew me exactly. And this is the first time I'd even had a chance to meet him in person because he wouldn't even meet with me for 10 years. It's been more, what, 12 years, Panya Deepa. Um, he just kept saying, she's not ready for me. And, uh, and finally, uh, last month, he sent for me to come and, and see him. And he just began, and he asked me a few questions, and then he said, you know, let's just stop this. I don't even have to ask you questions because I see right through you. And he just started going down the tick list. <laughs> And I was so happy, so happy to be seen and so happy to be known. You understand? Because I desire truth in the inward parts. How about you? And so, uh, so it was wonderful to find someone who, I mean, you might say, oh, I see you and know you too. But, I mean, seeing and knowing someone from a higher place. You understand? Someone who can pull you, who can uh, pull you up by their presence, by their influence someone you have confidence in, uh, someone who by their uh, own life uh, you, can, uh, you can take up uh, a, good, a good measure of how to, uh, how to live and move and have your being in this world. And so that's the Dharma. <laughs> And I want to talk a little bit about the Sangha. And one reason I do is because this weekend we have Bhante Sukhachita here. He's from Germany. And he hopped here all the way from uh, uh, Canada to stop over and to visit with us. And I think we have maybe 15 or so in uh, the retreat this weekend. But... I wanted to give uh, one last uh, plug for that retreat because he's teaching about spiritual friendship. Uh, and uh, I'd like to encourage as many of you as can uh, devote the time, you know, to attending, uh, attending this workshop. I like Bonte because um, most at least monastics, you, you know, we try to set a good example. And somehow in trying to set a good example, um, you can get to the place that you lose sight of, of where you, where you really are. And you, it's not like fake it till you make it just really start believing <laughs> you, you are that. But Bonte and I can like really talk. You know, we can talk about where we are, how we see things without any sense of shame, without any sense of blame, but just uh, mutually sharing and encouraging, uh, encouraging one another. And the only uh, person I have really met on this walk uh, as a monastic to be able to do that is um, my master Rinpoche and Panya Deepa. So it, it's very um, encouraging to know that that there are others who are not so firmly entrenched and attached to the tradition until it overrules the honesty uh, of the, that's required um, of, the, of the Dharma. And so he's a, a newfound friend, but a very good friend. And, and I'm glad he's here. Now he teaches uh, insight dialogue. Did I say that right? Inside dialogue, which is a is it's a, a, a little different way of introducing um, the teachings for uh, reflection, for uh, deep feeling, for um, uh, discussion, uh, and and so he takes you through several several different ways of responding to uh, to the teachings and and taking them in and uh, discovering uh, what we find inside of ourselves that, that resonate with the teachings 
uh, and and even to find our good self, our goodness, our good heart that's in there. I mean, the Buddha said that we all have as our the Buddha nature, the uh, awakened mind. Uh, as our inherent nature said, if you didn't, there'd be no way to get it. But because you already possess it, it's more like peeling back the skin of a banana until that is revealed. And so knowing that uh, as the basis of our inquiry helps us when we get to the, to the rough spots in our development, when we get to the tough spots in our, in our cultivation. But it also encourages us to not go so much on what we see or hear uh, about others or about ourselves or what we even think about others or about, our, or about ourselves. It's just a thought. It's just a partial seeing. It's just maybe even a mishearing. Maybe I didn't even hear what I thought I heard in the way, but, but that's the way my mind put it together. You see, you can't really say for sure. And what difference does it make? Really, you know, and so this uh, gradual loosening and letting go of having to dive in, dig into everything, to have to have an opinion about everything, to have to judge everything, to have to judge everybody. That's the the path leading towards our way of of release. Our uh, Buddha Dasa said, "Of all the prisons in our life, uh, views is the toughest." and the most uh, confining prison. That and the prison of purity, the thought that I am so pure. <laughs> so, in our country particularly, because there has been some affluence, because um, there has been some sense of a, of a rebel spirit, there's been uh, many victories, um, you know, uh, and a sense of elitism in a certain way, or certainly, certainly more for some groups of people than others, but amongst all of us, there is uh, some sense of that uh, elitism there. And, and so we have a habit of uh, blaming everything on others. And, uh, and we also feel like everything is, is polluted and everything is unhealthy. I mean, I go overseas to some uh, centers and I'm telling you, it's everything there. It's all kinds of bugs. It's so hot you can hardly breathe. You know, nothing gets washed. I, I remember when Panya Deepa and I went uh, to India and and uh, they were so proud of the accommodations that they gave us. And uh, right away, I think there were four or six or eight of us. Anyway, we all went out and we bought Clorox. We bought mops. We bought, we bought linen. We came back and we were all scrubbing down our rooms. And when the people who had provided the accommodations for us came and they saw that stuff, they, they, you know, they cried. They were so hurt. They said, I'm so sorry that, that we didn't have better accommodations for you. And immediately I was so chastened, you know, that I couldn't accommodate a little bit of, 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 of dirt just to be gracious to my host, you know, just in my ugly American kind of thing, you know, and I learned a valuable lesson for that, from that. And now when I go to India, you know, India, when in India, India is as India does. And so I'm like that. So if we sit and we eat off of leaves, I'm like, I'm not eating off a leaf. You know, or, and then the leaves, uh, it's not a fresh leaf. They like rinse them off. They don't use detergent. You know, they just rinse. Uh, when we drink with cups, they have a way of, of tossing the liquid into their mouth. We put our mouth on the cup. They toss it and then they just rinse it and give it to the next person. I'm like, no, where's the soap pop on that? But, you know, I've shifted now to be able to roll with that. But if I come back here, I want Dawn soap. I want it in the dishwasher so that the water gets to a certain temperature. You know, I want, you know, I got to have air conditioning. You know, I have to have two heaters in my room because, you know, 75 degrees is not, I'm not thinking about putting on a sweater when I can just turn the thermostat up and you pay for it. I get, you know, so, 
So this is the way that we are. This is the conditioning that we have. And then when we come to the Dharma, we bring all of those conditions with us. And naturally so, because they're already in us. And so we begin gradually by uprooting these kinds of thoughts and these kinds of ways of being. And we're moving towards passionlessness, fewness of wishes, um, and, uh, and somehow this cuts through that small goal-oriented goal vision that we have, that, that egocentric kind of vision. And uh, uh, we become more enlarged, more concerned about others, more uh, easily seeing others as ourselves, more easily recognizing how someone could be upset about something said in a certain way or done in a certain way because I myself you know, get upset sometimes about something said in a certain way or done in a certain way and seeing other beings like oneself, then we start to understand them more. And by the same token, we start to understand ourselves more. And this permits us to relate fully, more fully with our own lives and, and with the lives of others. So taking refuge in this uh, Dharma as path, we develop uh, the sense that it is worthwhile to walk on this earth. And then we take refuge in the Sangha. The Sangha helps us, you know, to realize that everything is path. Everything is Dharma. It means being willing to work with our fellow practitioners, our brothers and sisters, in the Dharma while being independent at the same time. So we're sort of like alone together. <laughs> and that helps to establish some boundaries. It helps to break down some sense of neediness. Uh, and yet we can be with one another with a kind of compassionship, a compassion that offers something rather than always needing to grasp something needing we can just be with each other and not need to be anybody you know no have to be anybody in particular uh, uh, nobody imposes his or her heavy notions on the rest of the sangha now we have come together in agreement that the dharma is worthy to be investigated so that's our point of of agreement. The rest of it we may agree and we may not agree. And even with the Dharma, because we're all at, at different levels of realization or have had different experiences, or and they can be, uh, let's even eliminate levels, just say that we see because of the way in which we have uh, lived our lives and our, uh, the karmic influence coming into this life. I mean, you don't think that life began the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb or popped out. What allowed the, con what allowed the conceiving that produced an individual being? It had to be more than your mama and your daddy. So I'm just saying that there was life even before this, even if you don't know what that was, even if you, uh, um, don't care what that was. If we look at how we respond to things, uh, I remember I looked at my son and I was like, wonder whose child is that? You know, because there was nothing about him that, that jived with the way we thought and the way, and the way we did things. And then my family, I was like the black sheep of the family. Well, we were all black, but I was the black sheep of the family. You know, they were like, like, she's so different from us. And so I was ostracized. Uh, pretty much in my family, except for one, uh, one sister. And, uh, and it's because I was different. And I wondered how I got in that family myself. You know, now I don't wonder. I understand about cause and condition that allow the rebirth in that circumstance. So now that I'm here, what shall I do? This is what we have to get to. We don't have to seek a special purpose for our life. We got here through cause and condition. But now that we're here, what shall we do? What a wonderful opportunity to seize the essence of a precious human life. What a wonderful opportunity to use this time. Now is the time. Now is the time that we could go all the way. 
Now is the time that we ourselves can, can awaken. And then we'll be part of the solution, not part of the, pro of the pro problem. Uh, each member then is, uh, of the Sangha is an individual who is on a path in like a different way from every other one. And we have to allow that space there. Uh, that we have to allow them to have their own understanding, you know, of, of how to, to piece everything together. We, it's, and it's because of that, you know, that we have problems when we come together and we live in close proximity. We have problems to get when we come together uh, and we meet a couple of times a week and everybody starts to think they know everybody else's business because we're so used to looking in those superficial, superficial ways. But we can use this as a training, as an opportunity to get constant feedback of all kinds, both negative and positive, both encouraging and discouraging, that can make us stronger. You know, the more a person goes through, the stronger they can become. These are, are we can consider each other very rich resources, you know, as we take refuge in the Buddha and the Dhamma. That means definitely taking refuge also in that unenlightened being that we call the Sangha, and also the enlightened ones that uh, overcame and, and that we uh, also call Sangha. Being kindly and understanding, you know, when uh, their neurosis is being experienced by us, and also allowing them to cut through our trips. Mm. allowing them to share their wisdom with us. This just takes a try and try and try until we get it right. Now, just really putting forth first the intention and then the effort, uh, and then we will have the results. If you plant apple seeds, you will not get a lemon tree. You will not bear lemon fruit. You will get an apple tree and it will bear apples. So whatever's coming in, up in our life, we have to look at it and not cast the blame anywhere on anyone, whether skillful or unskillful, just understanding cause and condition. With this kind of companionship in the Sangha, it's a, it's a kind of clean friendship. It's like not sticky, you know? It's not sticky and it's not, not needy. Uh, I like ice cream, but ice cream, because of the, you know, the dairy has a kind of stickiness to it, you know. But now I love Rita's uh, ice because it's like clean. It leaves, it's clean on your palate. It's cool and it's refreshing. It's like the Dharma like that, you know. Uh, so, so it's a clean kind of unsticky friendship you know uh there is an exp expectation we always say without expectations but of course there are expectations yeah but there's a difference between expectations and demands with with some expectation hoping for the best and trying to put forth our best on both sides yet without demands rather with as much compassion as we can muster and also, not only viewing others with kindly eyes, but ourselves also. Sometimes we can do that right in the moment. Sometimes we can do it five minutes later. Sometimes it takes an hour. Sometimes it takes a day, a week, a month, or a year. But do it we must. And as we do it, that time will shorten and shorten and shorten and shorten and shorten until the mind will completely shift. Grasping these three ideas of Buddha Dharma Sangha, not intellectually, by infusion into our heart mind, you know, by becoming the very refuge that we seek is what it means to go for refuge. Seek refuge in your own capacity to awaken. 
May you be well and happy and peaceful. May no harm come to you and no danger. May you always be able to meet the inevitable difficulties of life.